Raman is a light matter interaction. Okay. That means light is falling on a, a material and it is light is interacting with the material and that interaction is what uh, causes the Raman effect. Okay. So when I actually talk about light matter interactions from your knowledge you know that the major things which happen in light matter interaction is either transmission, then reflection, and then you have absorption, which is the uh, other phenomena which will happen, and you have uh, luminescence, which is what fluorescence, phosphorescence, and uh, luminescence happens. So these are the major things light matter interactions happen. But along with that, uh, always, what happens is that you have scattering. And here I have used a word called elastic scattering. Elastic uh, scattering, when I say, you would have all remembering something called elastic collision, right? So when you were studying in your class 10, 12, you have been told about elastic collision. Elastic collision, when we say that, uh, it means the energy before the collision and after the collision remains same. Right? And in the case of light, we always talk about energy as h nu, and nu is frequency, and since uh, light travels with speed of light, the frequency will be changing uh, generally, and that means energy changes, frequency changes, and that's how we distinguish between blue light and the green light and red light, right? So the frequency is associated with the color of the light also, right? So, if there is no change in energy, means no change in color. So, that means elastic uh, scattering means there is no change in color. And that's what I have shown, green light went in and green light comes out. The difference between scattering and reflection is that reflection will follow a particular rule called the Snell's law, that is angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. And that is not followed by scattering. Okay. So it comes in all directions. And uh, what is very interesting, and probably nobody actually even taught you, is that whenever I ask this question, I have told this earlier in this same auditorium, that if I ask the student, how do I see you? Which of these phenomena I told is the reason I see you? 99% of the people will say that we see you because of the reflection. Am I correct? You would say that answer, right? But that's wrong. Reflection is not the reason for seeing you. The reason I see you is because of the scattering. Okay? And that is very easy. And whenever we talk about anything we want to prove, we have to demonstrate that it is correct. Right? So, I ask very simple questions since many of the audience here are women. Uh, I ask you when you actually dress up to go to a photographer or to a function, uh, what do you do? Do you actually apply a powder, foundation or you apply uh, oil? Because when you apply oil, you will start seeing more reflection, right? You get a smoother skin, cream, anything like that if you apply it like this. When you go to take a photograph, if you are going to a function where you are going to be photographed, then you will use foundation and foundation makes your surface rough, right? So roughness means you won't get good reflection, right? So why do you do that roughness? This is taught to you, but you never ask that question because you don't want reflection. If you are, another example for that is if I ask you today to take a photograph in a, uh, in a studio and you are not dressed up for the occasion, you will see that the studio guy is actually removing certain reflections from your face. That means he doesn't. Second thing you would have realized that the studio, when you go, you do not find light falling on you. You see two umbrellas, white umbrellas. Do you see that? So why are we putting not light on you, but you are putting umbrella because you want diffused light. Diffused light gives you less reflection. Right? All of these things actually are happening to you. You have seen it, but you never questioned it. This is exactly the point I have been telling, that we never, we see things happening around us, but we never question, why did, why do you do this? Why, why is that when you are uh, in a, a, a reception, the light is kept upwards, not on the face. They never put the light on you, they will put it upwards because you want all the reflected light 
diffuse light falling on you otherwise you won't get a good picture so these are the things so that elastic scattering is the reason why we see each other very interesting but 99 98 90 70% or 80% of the things will happen only reflection refraction then uh, uh, absorption and illumination it's only that 5 to 10% is what the elastic scattering is and that's what is very useful for us now another interesting thing happens is in elastic scattering again like collision when i said elastic scattering no change in energy here now the change in energy happens and that means the color changes so you can have a blue shifted light or red shifted light so this blue shifted red shifted light is actually the raman scatter and that's what is the interesting aspect that means it gives you something it's taking away the energy and that energy is what raman discovered and that's what got him the nobel prize and it is not very earth shaking to understand that such a simple experiment can be demonstrated in real life so i always take this you can also do that you have a good laser you just put in the laser you will see elastic scattering is happening here you see that this light is coming in all direction it's a transparent liquid when light passes through it it should not have any reflections it should go through as if nothing happened right but here the light is coming on the other side so that means it's a elastic scattering and since it is so intense elastic scattering that it saturates your detector and that's why it looks like white color but it's not actually white color you can also see the elastic scattering coming from the dust particles in the room if you have and that is the elastic scattering from the dust particle here the liquid is nothing but an organic liquid cyclohexane and it's a transparent liquid and it gives you light on all directions right so now when i want to see that there is a shifted light coming i just have to filter out the blue light so i use nowadays we have very specific and lasers are monochromatic it has only single wavelength so i can actually use that blue light filter and i can actually remove that blue light filter and it suddenly see that the blue light is gone i can see another color coming out of it this is raman scatter if i can understand where these lights are coming from the system that is what raman effect is okay so this is simple to demonstrate anybody can see it so the experiment doesn't cost too much of money today the raman spectrometer costs around crores of rupees but actually raman when he discovered he actually discovered with a such a simple machine and he has a prism and that prism actually this light is put in and he disperses it you know that prism actually produces this go and then you can actually have splitting then you take a photographic plate and he actually demonstrated this to everybody who visited his lab and he took the photograph and that photograph is the reason why he got and this is the instrument he got the nobel prize with and this doesn't cost you too much of money and it that is all was necessary so it is not the instrument cost that makes it uh, good it is the idea which actually works so most of you should realize that how you can understand the phenomena and that's what gets you the uh, very interesting result this is how the elastic scattering he recorded the first raman spectra he recorded you see his student that time was ks krishnan and he did, did it on organic molecules and he saw that this is the elastic scattering and this is the red shifted light you see many different colors and here this is the blue shifted light and on either side it was present and that's what is the raman scattering and that's what he analyzed now you get this that is not enough you need to know who what produces these uh, lights and that's what is the theory of raman spectroscopy and that's what i'm going to tell you how does one get this shifted light so today you do not need to actually spend so much of money because today we want to use it for multiple applications and you want to do it you can actually make your own raman spectrometer and it's very easy to do you get you go to amazon and see for a green laser it costs around 1000 rupees you can actually put a filter and make it monochromatic and pass it through your liquid to uh, any any system you do not have to even remove it from the bottle and then nowadays you get fiber optic cables so you can actually collect the scattered light into the fiber optic cables 
and then you can put it into a dispersing unit. Basically, it's a prism. In nowadays, prism nobody uses. You use grating, and this is the grating here. Here is the grating. You have a mirror to reflect this light onto the grating, and then this disperses the light, and it falls on a camera. And nowadays, you can even use an SLR camera, which you actually use it to photograph yourself, and take a photograph. And you see, what do you see? You see the elastic scattering. It was a green light, elastic scattering, very strong. And then you get the shifted light, and that's Raman scattering. And if I digitize it, I get a spectra. Now I get wherever the light came in. You get a peak here, so you have a Raman spectra of the molecule. So this is what is Raman spectroscopy, and it's so easy to do it. And we also can develop this very easily. It doesn't require so much of money. But then, why do you actually pay so much of money for the Raman spectrometer? The reason is that how good you can resolve it, how nicely you can get it, how very little signal you can enhance it. That's what increases the cost. Okay, so that whatever peaks I showed was intense. But if I have very weak peak, I should be able to get it, and that's what is the cost going into. Okay, so that's all is there. So basically, why is uh, Raman not become popular when Raman discovered in 1928 when he discovered this phenomena? It took so many years for people to use left and right Raman. It was never used because initially Raman never used lasers. He used uh, sunlight. Actually, he used to have a hole in his lab. The sunlight used to come. His experiment used to happen between 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock because the sun will go away, right? So he used to use the sunlight to do this experiment. And subsequently, he started using mercury vapor lamp. And then lasers came in 1960, and that is where the change happened. And since lasers came, most of the technology went outside of India, and nobody makes Raman spectrometer in India at all. That is the sad part of it. This discovery happened here; nobody makes it. But it is very easy. But another reason why most of the spectroscopic techniques, like you have NMR, you have IR, you have ESR, you have uh, microwave, you have radio wave. All of these things are absorption techniques. Even UV visible is an absorption technique. So they are quantitative because whenever it is an absorption, one photon comes, one photon gets absorbed. So it's a quantitative tool. But this is a scattering technique. It's a secondary effect. So it is not a quantitative tool, and that's why Raman took it. Why? Second thing is that it's a chance factor. That means one photon comes, how many uh, such photon may actually get Raman scattered. So you can see that if I actually have elastic scattering. I told already it is about three to five percent of the light gets elastically scattered. In that three to five percent, if I have ten to power of seven photons coming in elastic scattering, then it's only one photon which gets Raman scattered. So now you see how weak the Raman phenomena is, and this is exactly the reason why Raman took a lot of time for becoming a household thing. Today we can actually see one photon. If one photon comes, I can detect it. It's called photon counting mode, and today detectors are there which can detect. And that's why Raman has become very powerful. And today Raman is used in every field. There is, you will find out of the number of papers which are being published, whether it is chemistry, physics, or biology, or any other area, nanotechnology, any of those things, Raman spectra will be there in the paper. You can do a simple Google search on this, and you'll find that without a Raman spectrometer, there are 80 to 70 to 80 papers. The public uh, percent of the papers will have Raman spectra. So it has become a household. But today, people do not understand it. That why does it happen? So basically, it is the molecules which are actually present in molecules or atom uh, clusters which are present, which actually do certain things, and that's why we get this spectra. And here you can see that when you have uh, electronic levels, it is given by two levels, like UV visible. There, there is. This has vibrational levels, so the atoms actually can vibrate, and that has energy, and that's what couples with the electronic state. And then you are rotation. So you can have Raman, electronic Raman. You can have vibrational Raman, and you can have rotational Raman. All of these things. But today, I'm not going to talk about this. Or this, I will be only talking about vibrational 
Rama in today's talk. Okay, so there are many Rama which can be done, but we do not have to worry about it. Now, now I'll uh, uh, come back to this again. That in class 12 also you have been told that if you have an atom or any object, suppose you are uh, you have a body, uh, an atom present in this, uh, then when it moves. It, its movement can be told by three coordinates x, y and z right so if i have 10 such particles which are not connected to each other then this 10 will be moving and each of them can be moved by three coordinates and so that means the total degrees of freedom what you say is 3n right now if i start connecting them once you connect them they cannot if one moves the other one has to move so there will be a constraint which is coming but the degrees of freedom cannot be lost this total 3n degrees of freedom should exist so this degrees of freedom will remain but now suddenly what happens is that their motions become controlled and there they have three types of motions one is all of them move in the x direction all of them move in the y direction and all of them move in the z direction this kind of motion is called translational motion and because they are connected to each other, they can ro rotate around an axis. So along x-axis, y-axis and z-axis, three axes they can rotate. So that means rotational degrees of freedom. Then you also have remaining vibrational degrees of freedom. That means center of mass remains constant and atoms move around the center of mass. So this is the vibration. So there are three vibrations. And total number of vibrations then come is three rotational degrees of freedom, 3 translational degrees of freedom, remaining is here. So 3n minus 6 would be your total number of vibrational modes which will come. But suppose all the atoms were connected in the one uh, row, that means linearly, all are connected, then what happens because atom is a very tiny thing, this rotation is not possible. So you lose one of the rotational degree then the total number of vibrations will be 3n minus 5. Okay? So that's what is the thing which I have actually said here in this particular slide. So you can have 3n minus 6 or 3n minus 5 depending on whether it is linear or not non-linear. Right? So this is all the total number of vibrations. And why did I say this vibration? Because they are very unique vibrations. Now if I have two atoms connected to each other, whether what I atom I do not have to worry any two atoms can only do see 3n minus 5 right so n is 2 2 atoms 3 into 2 is 6 6 minus 5 is only one vibration will be there so that vibration is always this stretching vibration so any two atoms say nitrogen n2 o2 h2 any of them will be only vibrating in this fashion there is only one vibration allowed in this system, right? So such a beautiful thing that if I have two atoms, the only vibration which is there, so it becomes like a fingerprint. Already you can see that I can understand if there is only one vibration existing, that means it has to be a diatomic molecule, right? So you can see I have taken uh, two atoms and specifically I have taken this example where I have taken HF and HCl. The only two things which are changing is F and Cl, right? That, and you can immediately see that F and Cl, Cl is bigger and F is smaller because in the periodic table you should have seen fluorine comes first and then comes the chlorine, right? So the mass is bigger and as soon as you know that this vibration is dependent on how heavy it is. If I am vibrating, I will be slow compared to the people like you who are thinner than me, so you will be vibrating vigorously. I always say, you always say, now the kids are always energetic, right? So you have more energy when you have lighter atoms. So this is a, you can see the vibration is faster and here the vibration is sluggish, right? And it is actually given by a, a particular energy term which is called centimeter inverse. Again, it is a very interesting thing in usage of centimeter inverse because Centimeter inverse is actually length inverse, right? How can it be an energy term? 
it's very easy to understand because you know E is equal to H nu, I have told you. And frequency is also written as C by lambda because H nu, uh, nu is actually written as C times uh, divided by lambda. And 1 by lambda is actually centimeter inverse or meter inverse or any of those things, right? So H and C are constants, Planck constants, HC. So I can always multiply that to the lambda, 1 by lambda any time, right? So that is a constant, it is number, right? So I can always find that this is an energy term itself. Why do we use centimeter inverse is because it is very easy to actually go linearly. If you look at the frequency, they will be 10 to the power of something, right? So it will be non-linear, right? So and lambda also will be in 10 to the power of minus 10 or something like that. So they are non-linear. But 1 by lambda becomes linear and that's the reason why spectroscopists, especially Raman and Iyer, use centimeter inverse. So that's the reason. And it is a very easy conversion that about 8000 centimeter inverse is roughly is equal to 1 electron volt. You know that electron volt is a band gap between electronic levels, right? 1 EV is band gap, right? Sometimes. So this is the equivalence of that. So you can see that this is 8000. So that means HF vibration is about 0.5 milli electron volt. Uh, sorry, 0.5 EV. That means 500 million. So most of these vibrations happen between 50 milli electron volts to 500 milli electron volts. And that is in the IR regime. Uh, and if you convert the infrared uh, energy that comes in the same range and that's why it's an absorption process there. So IR spectroscopy is exactly like Raman spectroscopy. It's only a complementary technique of those two. Now I added one more atom and you can see I have added in a way that it is not linear now. Okay. So this is I have taken an example of water H2O and uh, that is the molecular set. And if you do the mathematics correctly, 3n minus 6, 3 into 3, 9, 9 minus 6, 3. That means 3 vibrational modes. And you can see one vibrational mode is uh, stretching, symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching, and symmetric bending. Right? So it is how any two molecules which are forming, any molecule which has an AB2 structure where they are actually forming this way will always have these three vibrations. No difference. The value of this energy will be different depending on the mass of this system. Right? So it's now you can start seeing that there is a correlation between the vibrations and the type of bonding they have. And that's why it has become very powerful. I can exactly know what kind of molecule it is. I, without even touching it, I can know if I know the frequency of that vibration, right? So I can actually know the energy and that energy will be actually telling me what is the vibration. I added one more atom, one more atom, NH4, right? NH3, as they can, ammonia. It's like a pyramidal structure, right? And the moment I have a pyramidal structure, and now I say 3n minus 6, right? So that means 3 into 4, 12, 12 minus 6, 6 vibrations. But what do I show? 4 vibrations. You see that? I am only showing 4 vibrations. One is symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching, symmetric bending, and asymmetric bending. Now, again, one more thing you should realize. Whenever I say bending, angle is changed not stretch. in stretching the bond is changing right and you know that whenever you want to change the angle uh, the bond it is much more energetic so that's why always the stretching modes will occur at higher energy compared to the bending modes it's so easy to understand now you why did it have not six vibrations but only four vibrations here that is because you look at beautiful structure of this ammonia it is like this. It's symmetric. I look at from here, I look at from here, it looks similar, right? Because of this symmetry, many of the vibrations are same. I cannot distinguish the vibration. So there is degeneracy. This vibration, like one is stretching, two are bending. You can see that I could have this stretching and that two bending, right? So that is, that is the reason why. That's called degeneracy. So many of the vibration modes become degenerate. So one more thing you learned now 
that if my molecule is more symmetric, my number of vibrations will be lesser. And when my molecule is not symmetric, I will have all the vibrations, which it should have. They will be distinguished. So immediately I can distinguish whether my molecule is symmetric or not symmetric. Looking at the spectra, I can say, oh, I have less number of vibrations. It has to be a symmetric molecule. Right? So very quickly I can come to the structure of the molecule itself. If I would have taken 7 atoms, according to your degrees of freedom, 3n minus 6, 3 into 7 is 21, minus 6 is 15 vibrations, but I am showing only 6 vibrations. But you look at the molecule, it is octahedral. Octahedral is the most symmetric molecule in the nature. And you can see octahedra, I look like this, I look like this, I look like this, everything looks same. So they all become uh, degenerate, many of the vibrations. So here is the symmetric stretching. This is asymmetric stretching, these two. Here it is symmetric bending. This is asymmetric bending. So you can see any vibration can be collapsed into four types of vibrations. Symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching, symmetric bending, asymmetric bending. Okay? So this is all. And always it depends on what kind of bonding exists between that, that you can actually cut. Today, I even take a protein I can actually, protein has 20,000, 30,000 atoms. Computers are there to tell me what kind of vibrations will be there. And they are so unique that I can actually see those vibrations. You can even demonstrate how they vibrate. So, today we do not have to do this mathem mathematically. We can actually do it by computers. And you can actually get all of these vibrations done. And you can actually understand what the energy of these vibrations are. Now, why did I say that these vibrations, I have told about light matter interaction, I talked about vibrations, now I am going to combine these two. Why did I have vibrations? Now, when light falls on any molecule, what is a molecule? You are also in 10 standard, 12 standard, you have studied about two ball and a spring, and you say about simple harmonic oscillator, you have talked about that in your 12 standard. What is that? A spring is there, ball is there, it will also vibrate only this way. And the frequency of that vibration depends on the spring constant. That means the spring strength and the ma reduced mass of this object which is connected. This is what you have been taught. Now, what is the difference between two atoms connected to each other? It is exactly the same. Two atoms is the bond. Bond is the spring constant and mass of the atoms is the atom. Right? So now you can also say that this exactly explains the spring uh, atom. Only difference between the atom and the ball is, atom is actually made up of charges. It has nucleus and electrons. And when electro electromagnetic radiation, which is falling on it, electromagnetic radiation has electric field and magnetic field. I am only looking at the electric field. Now electric field changes with time and changes with space. Right? It is, you have been told it actually oscillates, right? So it changes with uh, time and it changes with space. Since light is parallel with speed of light and the vibrations of the atoms are slow, at any given point of time, light will reach the atom and atom won't have moved from its position. So it will always be looking at time. So henceforth, I will not look at the space. Okay? Now what happens is, as soon as light falls, electric field falls, what does it do? It separates charges. Light will separate charges because it is actually having an electric field. Electric field will separate charges. The only thing which can move is electrons. So electrons move away from atom. Usually atom and molecules are not neutral, charge neutral. But the moment the electron falls, it will become charge separated. And the moment you have positive charge and negative charge separated, you have created a dipole. And this electric field is moving. So the dipole is oscillating. Electric field here. Now you know that this dipole is oscillating. And in 12th standard again it has been told, any oscillating dipole produces electromagnetic radiation. Correct? So that is what is happening now. This earlier the atom, which, uh, molecule which was actually doing this vibration, now it, because of this electric field is producing electromagnetic radiation. This is elastic capacity. That's what is giving you the, all the directions light. And that frequency is exactly matching with the frequency of your uh, excitation. Now, along with that, okay, I went one step past. So, while it is actually 
uh, oscillating. Now what happens is that along with that it is also vibrating. My molecule is vibrating. So what happens is when it is vibrating the electrons will have to move with it. Now this electron which is moving with the vibration is going to be affected by the, the light which was actually uh, separating them out. So this dipole is going to no longer be dependent on only a constant alpha which is polarizability of the electron. Alpha is the polarizability of the electron. How easily I can actually separate the electrons in the molecule, right? That's the polarizability. Now that polarizability is going to be affected because the atom is moving. So it will be a function of your, this polarizability will be a function of your oscillation. And now the moment it is a function of oscillation, it is now going to be, it's going to be dependent on. And again in your younger days in mathematics, you have been told very small oscillations can actually be written as uh, Taylor series and that's what Taylor series is. You will actually have a Taylor series which will be happening. Now what happened is that this alpha which was supposed to be a constant no longer is a constant. It has a constant term but it is also expanded in terms of this vibration, the oscillations of the molecule. Now when I put it back, this is the Taylor series, if you go and look at your class table, you will find it, you use class table, right, in your uh, class 12, it has Taylor series, it is given in that. So now, I put back all my numbers back again. I have a frequency because of your electric field, I have a frequency because of my oscillations of the molecule, I just put it back. And suddenly I see that this induced dipole, which is supposed to oscillate, is now oscillating with multiple frequencies. And you see one of the frequency is the same as the elastic skirting and the second frequency is cos A into cos B. Again, remember your trigonometry. Whenever you studied cos A into cos B, you always realized that it was cos A plus B and cos A minus B. If you do that, you will get cos A and cos B. Again, the mathematics which you learned trigonometry at the earlier stage. Now I substitute, suddenly what do I see? I have three components. One is the elastic scattering. This is omega L minus omega M, which is means energy and the lower energy. That means red shifted line. And this is the blue shifted line. See the vibration has actually suddenly introduced an electromagnetic radiation, which is red shifted, blue shifted and same color. So elastic scattering, inelastic scattering, this is the red shifted this is why vibrations are getting coupled and I am able to see Raman scattering. So the red shifted light and the blue shifted light exactly matches with omega L minus omega M and omega L minus M. This is why in Raman we say Raman shift. That means what is the elastic scattering? How much did it shift? And that means that shift is exactly equal to the omega M, the vibration of the molecule. So the energy between, distance between the Elastic scattering and inelastic scattering gives me directly the energy of the vibration. That's simple, right? So this is what made it possible for understanding that the vibrations are actually getting inelastic scattering of light, right? So uh, I hope uh, you are able to understand what I have said. Right. Now, when vibrations happen, the I told polarizability, right? When will it be Raman active? There is a concept called Raman active and Raman inactive. Every vibration need not be Raman active for vibration because the reason is that there is something called Do alpha by Do q. I don't know whether your mathematics you remember again. What is uh, a differentiation of a function? Mathematics. If you have function you have plotted, differentiation is the tangent drawn to at any point of time. Do you remember that? So that means the slope of the curve at that point is the differentiation, right? Here, the do alpha by do q is at the equilibrium position. That means alpha is what polarizability. How does my polarizability change, right? That's what is the alpha. And that as a function of vibration is what is do q, right? So if I plot that, you see when I have an atom, this is I have taken water molecule. And if I take the water molecule and then you see that there are electrons here, there are electrons here. When the vibration happens, that means symmetric stretching, the atom moves here and here, what will happen to the density of the electrons? It will get rarer. 
right? When the density is rarer, what will happen is when you stretch it, it is difficult to polarize because you have less electrons with it. When you compress it, electrons get denser. So when it compresses, you will have more electrons and then it can be more polarized. So that is exactly what I have shown. When it stretches, it goes lower energy, lower polarizability, higher polarization. So it is a monotonically increasing function. So a slope at equilibrium will be non-zero. You know that dou alpha by dou q is actually zero for a maxima or a minima of the function. Again, your mathematics, I am actually reminding you that whenever you have take a function and if you have a zero for dou alpha by dou q, it is called a maxima or a minima. Here, there is no maxima or a minima because it is a continuously monotonically increasing function. So, this slope is non-zero. So, that means it is Raman active. So, dou alpha by dou q is non-zero. It is Raman active. So, in this also, you can see that all of these vibrations will give you a non-zero. So, here, there is no change in uh, uh, dou alpha by dou q at q is equal to zero. So, that is why all the modes of the vibrations of water or AB2 will be Raman active. Now, I have taken, so I, I can show that many other molecules it will be a maxima or a minima and that is why it will not be Raman active. So, these things I will tell you later. Now, again, what did I say? I have done a very, I have not talked about atom as quantum mechanics. I have only talked about classically all of these things. But there is where the problem comes because the red shifted light and blue shifted light, the intensity is this. It is exactly the same. But if I do the Raman, you will find that this is not true. If I look at the red shifted light, they are much stronger compared to the blue shifted light. They are the real. That is why, that is because of the quantum mechanics. It is because of the quantum mechanics that this happens. So, here, just to correct for that intensity, I always do the quantum mechanical correction, but otherwise everything else can be told without quantum mechanics itself. I am taking light and I am taking atoms and interacting with them without any quantum mechanics. So that's what I will do. I will quickly go through this. I will not try to give you too much mathematics. I will just make it very simple. So whenever you have any light falling on any material, it has to be absorbed. It has to be absorbed completely. right? So, the only thing which can absorb light is electrons. So, you have electronic levels here, but all electronic levels are coupled with the vibrations also. So, I have just separated them out. So, this is vibrational level, this is vibrational ground state and the excited vibrational ground state. Now, when light falls on it, what happens is that it will actually get absorbed. The electron will go into an excited state. Now, all of us have been told that electron has to get, have a level to go, only then the absorption will take place. That is called what has been told as real level. Now, it is interesting in quantum mechanics that you can also have, when a molecule is excited, you can create new levels which are only short life. They are created when the electron is excited. So, this is called virtual states and that means they are not real states, but they are virtual states. So, they can actually get excited and they can stay for very, very short time and they will come down immediately without actually taking time. That is instantaneous and that is why it is 10 to the power of minus 15 and seconds and less. So, you know that fluorescence is 10 to the power of minus 6, but this is 10 to the power of minus 15, very fast. So, the electron will immediately come and that is the elastic scattering. That is what happens most of the time. But while it is excited, because the vibration and electronic states are coupled, it can also have a possibility that the vibrational state can get excited because it can give energy to the vibration state. It will go to the excited state. And once it goes to the excited state, that part the energy is lost. And when it comes down, now it is red shifted. The reverse is also possible that you can have an excited vibration state giving energy to the electron and coming to the ground state. Then the energy of the electron will go up and when it comes down, it will be blue shifted. Right? Now, so these two processes are what Raman effect is. So, it is a vibrational coupling and now it is a quantum mechanics I was talking. 
Now the only difference between these two is at any given temperature, you know that most of the things like to be in the ground state, not in the excited state, right? So this process will be less active. This process will be more. That's why the red shifted light is always higher in this. That's all is the answer for that. So I have quickly told you what happens in the real life. So that's why we only look at red shifted light in Raman. We do not look at the blue shifted light. So always whenever you are doing Raman effect, you are only looking at. If you remember my spec, uh, what I showed you in that uh, tiny uh, camera, I took the photograph. I was only showing the red shifted light. That is because of that. Okay. So we always do the Raman effect. Now I, you know the three processes which I have talked earlier. One is fluorescence, another one is IR, and IR spectroscopy, and the third one is Raman. All of them use the same energy levels. You see that this is the S0, this is the S1, and they are coupled with the vibrational state and the existing. So when you have a fluorescence, what happens is that this excited, it goes to S0 to S1, and then comes down. And when it comes down, it can come down from any of these levels to any of these levels. So that's why it is a broad fluorescence. Fluorescence is a broad process. And that's why fluorescence is not easy to multiplex in most of the cases. If you look at biological systems where people actually use this fluorescence, you need a minimum gap between different fluorescences. Otherwise, they will be bleeding through each other and that's why you will have multiplexing issues coming in. So this broadness is the reason for it. But the same level, if I go and come down to any one of these levels, the distance between this is the only difference. So they are very sharp. That's why Raman can be multiplexed. That's the reason why we can actually distinguish between each of these vibrations. But any time you expand this vibration, any time you expand the fluorescence, you will see Raman sitting on top of it. You can actually see that. But Raman is a weaker phenomenon compared to fluorescence. Because of that, you do not actually see this very nicely until unless you have very good spectrometers. So generally that is the way. But in the case of IR, you don't even go to the higher S0 to S1. You only go excite the vibration levels. They are directly that much energy is supplied. So that is why it's an IR is an absorption process. Energy. So you can see the comparison between all the three. And this is what basically you should remember. So, Whenever I actually look at any Raman spectra, red shifted light, I look at it, it will have peaks. These peaks are very, very significant to how the atoms are connected to each other. Now I am showing a spectra of carbon tetrachloride, which is a tetrahedral molecule, right? And tetrahedral molecule has uh, four atoms connected to one atom in the middle, and they are actually having. And today I can tell that these are actually related to very specific vibrations of the carbon tetrachloride. And you can see this, this is the strongest peak which is symmetric stretching. The higher energy peak is the symmetric, asymmetric stretching. You can see one is contracting, others are expanding. Similarly, this is uh, actually symmetric bedding and this is asymmetric bedding. You see that such a complex molecule, I should have had how many peaks? Uh, you have 5 atoms into 3, 15, minus 6, 9 vibrations, but I actually have only 4 vibrations. That is because it's a, even though it doesn't have a center of symmetry, it does have a very symmetric molecule. If I look from this side or that side, it looks same, so there is degeneracy. You can see each, each of these peaks may be more than one, but because they are symmetric, they are degenerate. They fall on to the same frequency. And that's why you are not seeing. So that's why carbon tetrachloride or methane or SO4, all of these things will have a very nice, beautiful such spectra. And they are like fingerprints. So I can, looking at this spectra, I can say it is a tetrahedral molecule. So that is again to tell you that there are very beautiful examples to say that they are like fingerprints of the molecule itself, spectra. So, another interesting aspect of it is that, which will be useful for many applications in biology, is the following. That if I look at this symmetric stretching, it should have been a single peak. But what happens is that I lower the temperature. This, this can be done in any spectroscopy. You are doing NMR, you are doing mass spec, you are doing uh, any of these spectroscopy, 
you just lower the temperature, what happens is that the width of the peak will reduce. So you can refine the peak if there are multiple peaks. NMR you usually do low temperature NMR to actually resolve the peak or low temperature mass spec to resolve the peaks to see what are the different components in there. So same way I have re uh, reduced the temperature. You see when I was looking at this, you can see that it is not looking like a single peak. The moment I lower, it looks like there are multiple peaks associated. Now the reason why it happens is because of the isotope effect. Now if you look at it, you can see that carbon has two chlorine and chlorine can be having two masses, Cl35 and Cl37. And the relative abundance of this is 3 is to 1. Okay? So when you have 3 is to 1 uh, ratio, that means 25% of any chlorine atom is actually Cl37. And that is not a small number. That means if I am randomly picking up chlorine, every fourth atom will be Cl37. That means it is a large number, right? I have so now you have four chlorine atoms and I have two types of atoms. You know how I can arrange. I can have all four Cl35, three of them Cl35 and one of them Cl37, two of them Cl37 and two of them Cl35, three of them Cl37 and one Cl35 and all of them Cl37, right? So there will be five different types of molecules which can be existing and each of them the difference is in mass and I said mass, you can actually see that there is a shift in this. The heavier the mass, it has a lesser energy. Lighter the mass, it has a more energy. Now you can understand that where it is coming. So the uh, higher energy is related to all the four being Cl35. And as you go now, you can see that. And the intensity of this is the highest. That is the relative abundance, 3 is to 1. What is the relative abundance of Cl37? Three, uh, uh, Cl35 and th Cl37, 3 is to 1, is the best. And now you can see that indeed the intensity drops down because it is very difficult to have all four of them Cl37. So the intensity of all four of them will be very, very low. So that is again there. So now you realize that when you have a complicated molecule, you can actually isotopically substitute them. You can put Cl30, uh, C13 or you can actually put deuterium instead of hydrogen. So these labile hydrogens can be replaced in biology with deuteration by putting D2O. So these kinds of substitutions can be done and I can actually see where the vibrations are coming. So isotope substitutions are very easy to be done in complicated molecules and I can see that I can really guess where the vibration is coming from. So this is another advantage of Raman that you can actually see this very easily. Now another interesting aspect is that if I look at IR and Raman, I told you IR and Raman are related to each other but they have very interesting uh, combination. If my molecule is very very symmetric like benzene ring, right? So my all of these modes of Raman, this is IR and this is Raman, okay? Now none of these vibrations match. You can see none of them actually match. There is no match matching between the two. This is called whenever you have a central symmetry. That means there is a central symmetry here that makes it that if IR modes are there, they will not be Raman. Raman modes are there, IR it will not be. So this is called mutually exclusive. The moment I remove this same benzene ring, I attach made it a styrene by attaching this. You see, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between many of these peaks automatically. There are a lot of peaks which are actually matching with each other. So this is what happens when you have central symmetry removed. So whenever you look at a molecule, if suppose you see there is a central symmetry, then you should do both IR and Raman to get complete idea of the vibration. But if you do not have central symmetry, you can do either IR or Raman and you can get the complete idea of this. This is another interesting aspect which you should remember. I will come to the Raman spectrometer. So I have given you an idea of many aspects of Raman and IR and how this is related, how vibrations get coupled to the light and how light actually is going to tell me which vibration it is. 
I can look at an atom assembly by computer program. I can actually find out what are the different vibrations, what their energy is. Then I do the Raman experiment. I can actually say that this vibration is because of that. I also told you about the uh, isotope effect that whenever heavier atoms are there, they will be shifted to lower frequency and higher energy, uh, lighter atoms will shift to higher energy. So that can be used to study the vibrations where they are coming from in a complex molecule like protein and others. You don't know which, which uh, amino acid is actually giving this. Because when I want to use this for drug discovery or anything, what happens is that I don't know where the drug is binding. So I can do an isotopically pure uh, amino acid if I guess that this is my binding site, I can actually look at the vibrations of that and see whether that is getting affected. I can actually predict without computer program, I can say where the drug is actually attaching itself. So these are the methods why I told you that isotope is a very, very important technique to actually understand. And in biology, you can do that because I can substitute N15. That is, nitrogen 15 is the isotope of nitrogen. Same way, I can oxygen 18 is a isotope of oxygen. Same way, deuterium can be substituted with hydrogen. So I can actually do these kinds of things. And you can get these amino acids which are isotopically pure amino acids and you can do the synthesis of your protein with these amino acids and you can actually look at the wild type and the uh, synthesized one. And you can compare the Raman spectra and talk about what is happening in the system. So this is for complicated systems which you can do. Now, whenever we look at the Raman spectra, what, uh, we need to have a Raman spectrometer, right? So when we are looking at it, there are two three things which we have to be very careful of. We need to exactly know where the frequency is because each frequency is associated with a particular type of atoms and molecules assembly. So the frequency shift has to be very accurate. So you need to have the peak position accurately determined. That's why the Raman spectrometer has to determine the peak position accurately. Then how much did it shift depends on the environment around it. Like I told you, isotope effect. How much did it shift will tell you exactly what is happening with you. So that your spectrometer should be actually able to detect that. Second, third is the bandwidth. How much is the width of the peak? That has to be also accurately determined. And you also need to find out the intensity of the peak because if the intensity is varying, that also tells you a lot about the molecule itself. So all of these things, a spectrometer, whichever you are using, should be there. These four things are going to determine how you interpret your Raman spectrum. And they are very much dependent on which wavelength of light you use, then how much of other light is getting inside, which is called the stray light, then you are how easily you are able to collect all of these scattered light that is the collection optics and spectral resolution how easily you can resolve the peak that is another one and then you have spatial resolution and confocality you are also going to learn confocal imaging here even in raman you have confocality which is possible and then you also have how i told you can i detect one photon or not that is the detector uh, possibility and how much of light is coming out of the sample determines my all the this thing. So whenever I am constructing, I showed you how the Raman spectrometer looks like. There are basic three things which are very important. One is the laser light which comes in and falls on your sample. The scattered light is collected and then you filter out the laser light so that that laser light is gone and then you disperse the light and you actually take a photograph of it. This is what is the Raman spectrometer which is there. So basically these are the things where all of these four characters are there. One is your peak position. The other one is how much did the peak shift. Third is the uh, peak width. And the fourth is the intensity of light. All of these things determine from these or these characters. Okay. So how does it affect? Basically, if I want to actually see the light, I should be able to filter the laser light accurately. If I don't filter the laser light, 
it is going to actually come out of the spectrometer and that is going to affect my laser light. So that means we should be able to filter this light very accurately and that's what makes a Raman spectrometer good. And when you filter out, you also remove Raman light because you are filtering out, there can be so much filtered or less filtered. So that also is a very important aspect. So you should realize that the filtering of the laser light has to be done. So you should know in your Raman spectrometer how are you filtering the, the original laser light? Because that will tell you whether I can get anti stokes line or stokes line, which is what I said, blue shifted light or red shifted light, or I can only get the red shifted light. All of these things are red. So these filters are very, very important to be looked at. I will not go into the details. Now, whenever you are filtering, you have multiple types of filters, and you can see that you can actually go very close to the laser light. This is zero. Is where the elastic scattering is and very i told you that raman is a shift i will not consider which wavelength of light i use i will only consider that as zero and count from there how much did it shift and that's what gives me the vibration frequency so you can have very close filters or very long filters so i that means i can lose out quite a lot of information because of this filtering issue so you should actually be very careful whenever you are using Raman spectrometer to know what kind of filtering is being done. And you can see if I miss out that you see the previous thing, if I was using this system, if I was using this filter, up to 150 centimeter inverse I do not get any information. But you see this is a spectro, uh, this is a material which has peaks below even 60 centimeter inverse. So I will completely lose out on that. So whenever I am using my spectrometer, suddenly I will say I am not getting any peaks because of this filtering. Did you understand? So you have to know about your Raman spectrometer. Just because you have a Raman spectrometer doesn't mean that you will get the spectra. You should also know where is it getting lost. And you will be making new material, new material and nothing is happening. I am not getting. If suppose it is going to be below 150, I will not get my spectra. And if I don't get my spectra, what will I do? If all my spectra happens to be in that region, right? So this sample has no spectra above this. It is, so I will never be able to say whether I prepared my sample or not. So that's why I said you should know what your filtering of the Raman laser line does. And that's where you should ask that question to the people. Next is resolution. How much can I resolve? That is the So it also depends on resolution. I told you one grating resolves this much. If I take that and put another grating, I can resolve more. If I put another grating, I can resolve more. So if I have more number of spectrometers, I can actually resolve more. And you can see this very easily. You see oxygen. Oxygen is O2. So I told you O2 vibration is only one stretching, right? This is the vibration of the O2. That happens around 1555 or something like that. It's around 1550. This is the vibration mode. But I also told there is rotational Raman. The oxygen can rotate, right? So the rotation has energy. It is coupled with the vibration. You see the rotational Raman of the vibration. See the beautiful rotational Raman. So if I have a better resolution, I can even see very closely spaced light in a Raman to see this uh, rotational Raman. So you can see, this is only an example to show you that I can actually see this kind of a, that's what changes the cost of the Raman spectrometer. If I have a lesser resolution Raman spectrometer, it costs less. Higher resolution Raman spectrometer, I will have a higher. So now you know how to look at it. What is the resolution of your spectrometer? So that's what it is. You see, in a normal spectrometer, you will not be able to see completely but the rotational part is there. It is That is the reason why this is actually looking like this. But the moment I resolve, I see this beautiful rotational Raman coming inside. There. So this is what resolution means. So when you resolve the spectrometer, you get more information about the spectra itself. Now, another aspect is, if I have a fluorescent molecule, I have a very fluorescent molecule, and I want to take a Raman spectrum, which wavelength of light? Uh, till now I never said what wavelength of light you can do. By the way, I can do, using X-ray I can do Raman. 
I can do with UV, I can do Raman. I can do with visible light Raman. I can do IR Raman. So any wavelength of light, I can do Raman. Because what I am doing, I put the light, I am filtering out that light and looking at what the shifted light is. It can happen for anything. So I can use any of them. So my molecule is a fluorescent molecule. That means, if I go to this level, fluorescence will be more. Now, if I put a laser light which is less energy than this energy level, equal to this energy level, and this is above this energy level, I can get Raman from all these three of them. So I have taken three lasers, and let us look what happens. The moment I do this, what is happening is, I have green. You remember the color. Green is higher energy. Red is equal to the fluorescence. And infrared is less than that. So remember this color. Now I have taken the Raman spectrum. You see, I am putting in wavelength, wavelength, not shift, wavelength. You see, this is green light. What is happening is that my fluorescence background is starting. And my Raman is sitting on top of the fluorescence background. This is exactly my fluorescence. The Raman is sitting on top of it. But when I am away from the fluorescence, I see only Raman, no fluorescence. So now you see, the wavelength actually has an importance in my system. So I need to select what kind of wavelength I should use so that I can get the Raman alone, but not the fluorescence. So this is where you need to actually ask the question, what are the wavelengths present in my Raman spectrometer? Now did you understand? Most of the Raman spectrometer will have only one laser or two lasers. There is no use. If your sample happens to be fluorescing, then it becomes a problem. Right? Now, did you understand? These are the things which you need to know. Now, Raman spectrometer will give you a Raman spectrum, but you will not be able to... You will always be looking at very, very small peak like this and then saying, I am not getting enough signal. Right? I just have to change the wavelength so that I do not actually have this problem. I get very nice Raman spectra. You see this Raman spectra? So that's the thing. So you have to really look at these things, right? The other, so I have just put this in Raman shift. You can see all of these peaks are lying on each other and you can see one of, only the infrared spectra gave me the Raman but not the red or the blue uh, or the green. It didn't give it. Now, you know that you use hand cream. It has aromatic compound, right? Benzene ring, right? So, benzene ring always is a very interesting for UV because when you have hand cream, it has aromatic compound. So, they have benzene ring. Benzene ring in UV visible absorbs in the 400 to 500 region, right? So, if I do a Raman spectra using 785, 633 and 473, 473 happens to be in the blue region, right? You look at the spectra, because it is absorbing in the red region, I get fluorescence here. But when I go to 785, I lose the fluorescence. And in the blue also, I lose the fluorescence, because it is away from the fluorescence. Right? But both of them give me the Raman spectra, but one of them gives me very strong Raman compared to the other one. The reason is, it has resonance. There is another aspect called resonance. If my wavelength of light matches with the energy excitations of the molecule, which is absorption of the molecule, because aromatic compounds have an absorption, very strong absorption. You do a UV visible of aromatic compound, you will have absorption in the 400 region, right? Strong absorption, it gives me a very strong Raman field. So this is another advantage, that you can actually use this resonance property to enhance your Raman signal. So this is another aspect which you should also be looking at when we are doing Raman. So suddenly you see that I use blue light, I get more signal. Red light, I use get less signal. So the reason is, I can also tell about what is the electronic state of the molecules also. So there are lot more information from Raman you can derive from doing these experiments. Another problem with laser is that only thing which happens with laser is it burns the sample. You know that in your childhood, you would have done this, you have a lens, you take a sun and put it onto your skin, it burns, right? But sun directly doesn't burn your skin, right? What are you doing? You are focusing the light, right? 
So whenever you focus the light, you are actually making all the intensity of light fall on a smaller area. So that is the problem. So your samples can get burned. While you are doing the, to increase the light, you have to focus. But when you focus, you increase the heat if it absorbs. Right? My skin absorbs many of the light rays from the sun, right? Because of your skin color. So it burns my skin, right? That's the reason. Heat is generated whenever absorption happens, happens right? So absorption should not happen. So you should know that when you use different types of lenses, you can actually have the power of the laser. Uh, so it also depends on the wavelength of the light as well as your power of the uh, focusing. So you can see the power density is quite different when you actually have microscopes. You look at most of your Raman spectrometer will have a microscope. So where you are focusing the light. So it depends on whether you are using. So if you are using a blue light, it focuses much more tighter. And that means the intensity of the light will be very high. And that means if the molecule absorbs, it will burn and it will produce a different molecule because it has burned. So you have to be very careful whether your sample is burning or not. So you need to actually also know that. So you should always start your experiment with the lowest power. If you reduce your power, then slowly increase the power till you are happy that you are getting good signal but not burning your sample. So you have to be very careful about Raman spectrometer. It can burn your sample and you will ultimately get with everything you burn, you will get carbon. And if you burn car get, get carbon, you will get graphene and suddenly you will get D band and G band in your system. Okay? That's what happens most of the time. And people suddenly say, I am getting graphene. It's not, you have burnt your sample actually. Right? So these are the interesting aspects of it. Okay? So that, that's what I am doing. Another aspect is that it also produces, when you can focus very tightly, you can also produce confocality. That's what is the other thing which you need. That's what if you look at the fluorescence confocal fluorescence spectrometer, you'll see the confocality depends on the focusing power of the system. Now, if my sample is transparent and my sample is opaque, which one should I use? Should I use a very high focusing system or less focusing system? This is another question people ask. So I take silicon. Silicon is opaque. It is opaque to most of the visible light, right? So if I do a very high magnification lens and focus it, that is 100x, 100x microscope objective I use, I get very strong. Blue is 100x, red is 50x, green is 10x. You can see when I go from in silicon from 10x to 50, 100x, I get more signal. That means whenever I have an opaque system, opaque to that particular wavelength of light, I should use higher magnification. But can I do the same thing with uh, uh, transparent sample? Let us see what happens. If I use a transparent sample, that means the liquid, which is actually transparent to the wavelength of light. You see, I use 100x and 100x is red and blue is 10x. You see the count? 10x is giving me more signal. The reason is when it is transparent, confocality is lost, right? 10x is not confocal. 100x is confocal, right? So my collection of uh, cylinder is lesser for 100, whereas 10x I have a larger cylinder. So I am having more sample. That's what happens. So whenever you have a transparent sample, it is better to use a lower magnification compared to the higher magnification. So you can see that when you do an experiment, you should be very careful of what your sample itself is, right? Now, Another thing which I was telling about is the resolution. Resolution depends on the spectrometer itself, how you can resolve. And spectrometer has, as I said, it is a dispersing unit, right? So it has a grating and it has a focal length because this is what basically is the focal length of the spectrometer. So whenever you look at the Raman spectrometer, it will be defined by the focal length of the spectrometer. That means they will say 550, 300, 320, these are the focal lengths of the spectrometer. The, so what happens if I have different wavelengths of light or focal length and grating size? What happens to my spectrum? So I am going to do a focal length change. That means my spectrometer is bigger, 
my spectrometer is smaller. What happens? You see, this is a shorter uh, spectrometer and this is a longer spectrometer. You can see that as you go to a longer spectrometer, you are able to resolve the peaks much better. So, one of the ways to resolve a spectra is to take a bigger spectrometer than a smaller spectrometer. So, when you look at the Raman spectrometer, you can know whether I can use this Raman spectra for my sample or not. So, bigger it is, always better because you can resolve it better. Right? Now, can I resolve it better with a smaller spectrometer? So, what I do is, I change wavelength. I change my wavelength. Can I resolve better? You see, for the same shorter wavelength and longer wavelength, uh, sorry, longer focal length or shorter focal length, I am changing my wavelength. wavelength. When I change my wavelength, you can see from blue, uh, this is UV, to all the way till infrared. As I go, I can see that my resolution is improving. As I go higher and higher wavelength, so for a same focal length, I can use a longer wavelength and I can get a resolution better. So, if I am tied up with a spectrometer which is small, I just use IR radiation, then I can get a better resolution compared to the UV. Did you understand? So, this is the easy way to resolve. So, same spectrometer, I can increase the wavelength and I can actually get a higher resolution. That's what happens in the uh, system. Okay. Now, this is an example of higher wavelength and lower wavelength of the same system. You see that this is the spread of the spectrometer in the blue region, uh, sorry, the green region and this is in the IR region and this is in the much deeper IR region. You can see the spectrometer is actually able to resolve much more. See, see this region. This region is having only 5 or 6 peaks whereas here you suddenly see more number of peaks. Same sample. And here you can see much more resolve, right? So, if I increase the wavelength of light, I can actually resolve the spectrometer much better. So, shorter the wavelength, lesser resolution. You see this peak? This peak is actually having three peaks only seen. One, two, three. Whereas you see the three peaks are much better. And here that peak is gone away because I am not able to take the spectra in the same region. Yes. Five more minutes. Yeah, done. Thank you. As you done. Okay, so another way to actually increase the resolution of the spectrometer is by changing my grating. So, I, my gratings have lines, right? Per millimeter, how many lines are there? So, this is 600 millimeters is green, 950 millimeters is blue, sorry, red, and 1800 millimeters is, uh, grooves per millimeter is blue, okay? Now, you look at the spectra. When I do with 600, you see this region, I only see two peaks, at the most there is some small peak here. But as I actually resolve it, you see in the blue, I see 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So as the number of gratings lines increase, I also can resolve. So I have kept my focal length same, wavelength same and I have only changed the grating. So these are the ways to increase my resolution. So, you are never limited. You can have the spectrometer, you can just change the grating. You can actually increase the resolution. You can change the wavelength, you can increase the resolution. You can increase the length of the vector, you can increase the resolution. So, there are multiple ways to do it. So, you are never stuck with a particular problem. You can actually do that. So, these are what it is. Now, another interesting aspect is my la laser light. How much does it penetrate through my sample? Because laser light, if it penetrates deeper, I get more information. Lesser, it gives me the top surface information. There are importance to this. So, I, have, I can see that I have taken a silicon. Silicon, uh, as the wavelength increases, it penetrates deeper. Because its band gap is around 1.1 EV. So, IR, it will penetrate deeper. UV and uh, this thing will be penetrating lesser. Now, what happens to my spectrometer if I... Uh, sorry, if I take a device of it. So, I have made, a, I have taken a pure silicon, deposited silicon germanium layer and on top of it, uh, I have very uniform silicon germanium and then I put again silicon on top of it. Now, if I do an experiment with IR laser, 785, it penetrates through all of them. So, that means it will give me signal from here 
signal from here, signal from here, signal from here. Now what has happened is I get this kind of a spectrum. This is because of the silicon at the substrate and this is because of the silicon uh, germanium layer. Now I reduce the wavelength. That cannot penetrate deeper. I have used 488 which is like blue green. It penetrates but it doesn't go to the silicon. The moment it doesn't go to the silicon, you can see the silicon has disappeared. And all of a sudden I am seeing a small peak that is because of the strain the silicon. Okay? Now I put another wavelength of light which is UV. It penetrates only like nanometers. And so I am not able to go beyond the silicon. So you see this peak which was very very weak. Now these two peaks have uh, disappeared. I can get only the strain silicon. So depending on the wavelength, I can actually look at which level I'm of the sample I am looking at. So that's what is the beauty. So you need to actually understand if you are having some layer, something is sitting on the top or something in the middle, which is the one which I can uh, use for looking at these kinds of spectrometers. So tissue imaging or in uh, uh, materials, materials imaging, all of these things can be done by the Raman. Okay? So now, final, I'll tell you how beautiful the Raman is and I'll stop with that. Four slides and I'll stop. Okay? So first one is, you see, Raman is so interesting that I have taken two examples. One is methanol, another one is ethanol. And my joke always is, one you can drink, one you cannot drink. Right? Yes or no? <laughs> so, the, how do I find out whether it is two different? Right? Methanol has no CH2. Ethanol has CH2 and just because of the presence of the CH2, you see the difference. OH remains OH, but you suddenly see CH stretching region has multiplicity because of the CH2 and CH3. And you can see suddenly new peaks are arising because of the deformation of the CH3 and CH2 and also a new peak because of the CCO. So, just because of one carbon atom increase, my Raman spectra is so different that I can actually, without even touching the bottle, drinking and seeing, I can actually tell which one is ethanol and which is methanol. And you know that you will not die, right, without doing it. That's the beauty of Raman spectra. You do not, IR you cannot do this way. It will be too difficult to analyze this. Raman is so easy. Okay, next. You all know today, we are talking about this every day. You know what is that? MDMA. It is in the news everywhere. Drug. Ecstasy. Right? Most of the children in, in Kerala are now in trouble because of this. Okay? Now how do I actually distinguish these two molecules? This is the original molecule from where it, this is made. Now I, this is my starting compound and this is my uh, MDMA. If I want to find out the starting compound is there or the MDMA is there, you know the difference is this is singly substituted benzene. I am not going to look at anything else. And this is triply substituted benzene. And there is benzene vibration. You know benzene can breed. This breathing vibration if it is connected at three points it will be lost. And that is 1000 centimeter inverse. You see this 1000 centimeter inverse? It is completely disappeared. I don't have to look at anywhere else. I can tell you that this is a starting compound or not. Just by looking at it. Whether I form the compound or not, you will have to do HPLC and all kinds of things to find out this in chemistry. I just do Raman, I just look at this 1000 centimeter inverse. I know that my compound has transformed into this. I mean, just this. But looking at this spectra, I, can, I don't have to do anything. I just scrape like this and then put it under the Raman spectrometer. I can tell whether you are taking the drug or not. That's easy. So that's the fingerprint of this molecule itself. So this is the beauty of that, right? Another interesting aspect is, I told you tetrahedral molecule, the spectra will look like it. If you are bright enough, if you remember what CCL4 I showed you, it had a new one peak which was strong, then there was new three peak which was uh, split, and there were two more peaks on this side. Now this is SO4. SO4 is like CCL4. Sulfur, oxygen, 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 oxygen. Right? It's a tetrahedral molecule. You see the spectra? This is new one. That is a symmetric setting, asymmetric setting, 
symmetric bending, asymmetric bending. Now, the two compounds are magnesium and sodium. Both have SO4. Now, you see the difference. It's beautiful that I can find out whether I have magnesium sulphate or sodium sulphate. Sulphur is a, sulphate is the same. But the moment I have magnesium, it is shifted to the lower energy. Why? Because magnesium has 2 plus charge. SO4 has 2 minus. So this is Coulomb, right? I am having a vibration and I am putting a charge in pulling it. What will it do? It will dab. So it will shift to the lower one, right? It is like a heavy weight on it. So it will actually reduce. I can easily say without taking out the sample, I can tell you whether it is magnesium sulphate or sodium sulphate, right? Okay? This is not a cold medicine. This is pseudo adiferin. This is adiferin. The difference is there are two chiral molecules here. Now, normally you would do any chiral molecule, you will do a CD spectra or something like that to find out that, right? I do not have to do that. I can find out this. You see, I most of the, this is same, right? So you see this is same. This is the benzene ring I told you. This is the benzene breathing mode, 1000 centimeter inverse. And everything looks same. Now carefully look at this. These peaks, intensity you see, they are reversed. Their intensities are reversed. You see the chirality. The moment I have a chiral molecule, the intensities will flip from those molecules wherever the chiral molecules are there. All the modes necessary will be there. So even a geometric isomer, with simple Raman, I can tell you whether I have a pseudo adipin or I have an adipin. These two are drug molecules you are making in pharmaceuticals. This is plant product. Both of them come from the plant and 50-50 is the racemic mixture it is. So you want to isolate one more than the other. I want to find out whether I isolate it or not. I don't have to do any chemistry. I just do the Raman I can tell. Easy, right? So that's the power of it. Another thing I wanted to tell you is that diamond is the favorite of women. So diamond actually occurs in nature in soil. And because soil is full of SiO2, that means silicates, and silicates get embedded in the diamond. And now you think which is harder, sand or diamond, which is harder? So that means nothing can trouble diamond, right? But I have taken a diamond which has an inclusion of silicate, laranite, calcium silicate, right? So it is got included in it, while forming it got included. Now you see the effect of it. Diamond, by the way, if you want to be sure that your husband or boyfriend has given you the diamond correctly, you can just go to the Raman spectrometer and put it. If you get only 13, 32 peaks, then you can trust that he loves you. Otherwise, he doesn't. Okay? He has given you a fake diamond. Okay? That's the easiest thing. Raman can tell you diamond very easily because there is only one peak, 13, 32 centimeter inverse, nothing else, done. You are having the right person with you. Okay. I just joke. Just like, don't take it seriously, otherwise you will divorce everybody. <laughs> so that 1332 is the peak for diamond. If I take the 1332 peak and actually look at, if I stretch, stretch the diamond, that means I put pressure on the diamond, then the 1332 peak will shift to higher. If I Along with it, it will shift to the lower, right? So, this is what happened, 13 that is it. I mapped it. You see this? This is the stretching. So, you see where the laranite is there, the diamond is actually stretched to 1338. That means I am actually squeezing it. How do I find out? I can actually put diamond inside a high pressure cell and then actually pressurize it and take a raman. You see, I take the 1332, I put pressure and it goes to 1338. And how much is the pressure? It is about 2.7 gigapascal. And you know that one bar or one atmosphere is the power of 5 pascal. So this is 27, 2700 atmospheres. That means that small laranite sitting there is putting diamond under such a strong stress. So you can see how things can change by just inclusion of an atom in between. Because it can change the electronic property of the material itself. You can actually see the kind of effect it can be done 
by a simple Raman experiment. In fact, another one is, is to find out whether it is crystalline or not crystalline. Crystalline peaks as in X-ray would be sharp. Whereas if it is amorphous, it will be broad, right? Same way in Raman, you can see that this is amorphous, this is crystalline. By looking at the Raman spectra, you can actually say whether your material is amorphous or crystalline. So easy. Similarly, I can find out if I have a solution and a solute, I can find out how much is the solution and solute without actually doing any other thing. You see, I have put what is this? 4 nitrophenol is added into uh, dichloromethane. Dichloromethane is a common universal solvent, right? So I have dichloromethane as a solvent and solute is uh, your uh, nitrophenol, okay? Now I want to find out the concentration of it. I just do the Raman. You see, as the concentration changes, the nitrophenol peak is actually increasing. And if I plot it in a graph, I can exactly know the concentration. Also, any other concentration from this graph I can find out. So even concentrations can be found out. And though I said Raman is not quantitative, but relative intensity change you can always do. So you can use it as a relative intensity. I can talk about concentration by doing this kind of an experiment. So I will stop here. I just told you how many different possibilities are there. Now you can use it in your own problems in the way you want. I will not actually go more than that uh, because I want more questions. So I am stopping here. So uh, please, uh, I will stop you. Thank you for your uh, attention and uh, hope at least you got an idea of what all you can do with Rama. Okay? Thank you.